Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome to the live Facebook, the show that discusses theological arguments from the book Haqq al Yaqeen by Sayyid Shabbar. Last week we discussed the Sifat al Thubutiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the positive attributes, the affirmative attributes, and we were discussing Qadr, Qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the most powerful, the most omnipotent. And we went through different arguments and examples. Uh, an example would be his creation and how the creation reflects upon the power and the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we'll discuss more with my co-host, Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Manjus. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Taqabbal ala a'walakum. Kum inna wa inkum, inshallah. How are you this evening? Hayakumullah. Alhamdulillah wa shukar. MashaAllah. So, uh, Sheikhna, last week we were discussing uh, qadr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being qadr, the most powerful. Um, a little recap, if you may, on what we discussed last week. Ahsantum. <sighs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim uh, As we established last week uh, The sifat through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Is understood by us mankind And uh, when we use the word sifat yani The attributes of Allah azza wa jal One of the most important aspects Of understanding Allah azza wa jal Tawheed To the extent that is possible By the human mind is that we say that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the essence of Allah azza wa jal, is not a separate entity from the attributes. Neither are the attributes a separate entity from the essence of Allah azza wa jal. And the pure and the almighty Allah azza wa jal, his essence and his attributes are one, inseparable. The attributes are the essence and the essence are the attributes and they are not separable or divisible entities uh, in that sense. And these are words that are used for us uh, in terms of human interpretation to humanly understand Allah Azza wa Jal. In regards to the first sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal which is described or which is tackled within the book Hakul Yaqeen by Al-Alama Al-Kabir Sayyid Abdullah Shabbar Rahmatullah Alay. In regards to Qudra to recap, Allah Azza wa Jal being all-powerful. All-powerful, yani the, uh, om the character or the attribute of omnipotence. And from the proof that Alama Shabbar relays in regards to this from the Quran, uh, in addition to the verses of the Quran, he uses these three forms of dalil where we said last week that if the creator cannot be the creator cannot be perfect if he is not all powerful to begin with yani perfection cannot be attained until and unless you have domain over that art of perfection for Allah Azza wa Jal, the perfection in itself is a demonstration. The perfection within the creation is a demonstration of the domain and the extent of the power of Allah Azza wa Jal. Rather, the power of Allah cannot be contained. So when we say the extent of his power, again we were speaking or we are speaking in, uh, in a language that is comprehensible by the human mind. Otherwise, the power of Allah Azza wa Jal has no extent, cannot be defined in either way. Number two, he said, it is impossible to create or yani to sustain a perfect system of creation if you don't have power. And you find over here that there are very two subtle, there's a very subtle difference and the argument put forward uh, by Sayyid Abdullah Shabbar Rahmatullah Alayhi is a very daqiq and a very precise argument. The first one is that perfection cannot occur without Qudra, without Allah Azza wa Jalla being omnipotent. The second argument is the sustainability of perfection. So the first argument is the occurrence of perfection cannot happen without a Lord who is all-powerful and has absolute domain over that realm of perfection. And number two 
is that you find that the sustainability of that perfection is not possible without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having total power over it. And these are the two arguments that are used by Alama Shabbar. And if I remember correctly, we went over certain uh, abstracts from uh, the grand writings uh, dictated by the master of the madhab, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh, in this compilation, which was then written and transcribed by his companion, Mufaddal ibn Umar, which is very famously known as Tawheed Mufaddal. And uh, this is where we left off last week in terms of establishing a fundamental aspect of Tawheed and a fundamental belief from the belief system of not only the Shia and the Muslims but for all monotheists is that Allah Azza wa Jal is all-powerful has domain and control over everything that can be perceived and cannot be perceived, over everything that has come into existence and that has not come into existence. I understand. I remember we were discussing that book. Uh, we were talking about um, the tears and, and the crying of the baby and how it is, it is vital for the baby to cry in order to remove certain uh, liquid from the brain. Um, and um, mashallah, uh, Shaykh, a question I had in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being omnipotent and all powerful. Others would argue and say, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful and has control over the whole universe and all of his creation, then why is there so much chaos? Why do we have poverty? People, people are dying of poverty all the time, starvation, uh, wars, things like cancer. I believe in this country, one in six, I think it's one in six people. In this country, uh, have, tes- have uh, prostate cancer, and then you have others. Uh, one in four, one in five are clinically obese, headed towards diseases such as diabetes, uh, diseases such as um, heart attacks, uh, and, and other other medical conditions. Sure. So, why so much negativity? If Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the all-powerful and omnipotent, why doesn't He remove such? Calamities upon mankind Right It's a very valid question A very contemporary question And um, indeed these, are the, these type of questions Are then used as objections uh, Particularly by individuals uh, Who don't uh, believe uh, In the existence of uh, Any supreme deity Or God to begin with uh, Nevertheless the question in itself Is very important The manner in which the question is answered depends on the person who is asking the question to begin with. So, if we are to be asked by an atheist or by a person who doesn't believe in the existence of of God or believes that this universe, for example, came into existence by chance, if a person who does not believe in God puts forward the argument that if God exists or why does your God not wave the magic wand and intercede and remove all the evil and all the poverty from the world? My reply back to this individual would be that your question has a fallacy. There is a logical fallacy in your question, Ajib. Why? Because... Enter as an atheist, you are questioning me over the actions or the inaction of an entity that you do not even believe exists to begin with. You cannot question me over the action or the inaction of an entity that you do not even believe exists. So the first and foremost, the first point, the foremost starting point is that let us sit down to establish the existence of God. Once this existence is established, then the next step is to understand why this God who already exists, why he intercedes or why he does not intercede, why he intervenes, and why he does not intervene. 
So long as the existence of God is not established, then trying to understand the intervention of God or the perceived lack of intervention of God is fruitless. It has no logical basis because we are hypothetically discussing action or inaction of an entity whose existence in itself is at question. And therefore, this in itself is a logical fallacy. It's a major mistake and an error in the model of thinking in the thought process. And this is why we believe that logic as a science is very, very important for us to understand and to study as we embark upon this journey of theology. Not only theology, but philosophy and politics and economics, economics and every other field. And funnily, uh, Bain al Qusayn, logic, uh, many times you'll find that uh, we have, uh, when there are certain arguments, be it religious or non-religious arguments, you'll see that uh, many times a famous rebuttal would be that, oh, that argument is not logical. Baba, why is it not logical? Because it doesn't make sense to me. Ya akhi, who said that the definition of logical is what makes sense to you? Mm -hmm. Aslan, the person who says this to you, who uh, himself is making a mockery of his intellect because it shows that he doesn't know the definition of logic to begin with. Mm -hmm. Logic, ya ani, very generally speaking, the definition of logic is what? A science that allows you to formulate arguments in a certain manner such that the arrangement of these arguments will then allow you to deduce the correct conclusion. Therefore, logic is a science that studies the process of formulating arguments, of arranging these arguments in order to deduce a conclusion that is correct. So we understand from this definition of logic that in order for this science to be applied, there has to be an input. Yani when we say the formulation of arguments in your mind, the formulation of arguments, where did these arguments come from? These arguments are not arguments that are created within the fragment or are not created from the mind in itself. There needs to be some input, yani knowledge, yani fact, yani dalil. And then organizing these pieces of information known as input in order to get an output, output being the conclusion. Therefore, it is a process. Logic in itself is a science that needs to be studied. And you find that if we were to follow this very basic and undisputed a definition of logic, regardless of whether it is Aristotelian logic or any other form, in the sense that this is an agreed upon definition from a philosophical and a theological perspective. Therefore, we say that uh, the person who doesn't believe in Allah Azza wa Jal does not have the right, falls himself, places himself into an ishqal because we are now traversing through a hypothetical realm in speculating over the actions of an entity that may exist or may not exist. For example, if I was to break this down, take for example football. And I know you're very keen about football as well. Ya Allah. You have a team, for example, that is not within the premiership. Mm -hmm. Take for example any team which is not in the Premiership. Mill? Millwall. Millwall. Millwall is not in the Premiership. Now if Millwall doesn't exist in the Premiership, does it make sense for you and I to sit down and to have a discussion on what Millwall's statistics may be if they were to be in the Premiership? <laughs> no. <laughs> Like the way you're laughing because it's such a ridiculous process to even waste yeah. your time in. Yeah, Akhi, the same argument is applicable over here. Yeah, Baba, we're sitting here to try and evaluate the action or the inaction of the deity and then gun that deity 
because of his inaction, when you don't even believe his existence to begin with. So there is a fault within that process. The first thing that needs to be done is that we establish the existence of Allah. So the debate with the atheist at this point is a debate that is a circular debate. It's a debate yani, built on logical fallacy after fallacy. Mm -hmm. This is one. If we are debating, and if I am trying to understand, and many times as, uh, as a person who believes in, a person who, who ascribes to a faith, a person who's a monotheist, a person who believes in the existence of God, many times I as an individual may find it difficult to come to terms with these two concepts. And this is where we say, Ya Habibi, the meat of the discussion is over here. And this is as a faith oriented person who subscribes in the belief of one God. How do I, and I also believe that this Allah, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in kadir, that he is powerful and has domain and control over everything. How do I consolidate this belief with the fact that when I open my eyes and I watch the news or I travel the world, like you rightly mentioned, millions of people are dying of poverty. The world in itself is in anarchy. Why doesn't this Lord, who we are spending time and effort to establish that he's all-powerful, why doesn't he just end the poverty that we see in front of us? We take the case of poverty. For disease, there is also the same answer, yani within the same kulli, kulli yani major argument, within the general major argument, the answer is the same, but there are certain particularities that might be tweaked or certain particularities that need to be understood better in order to understand the issue of disease. For poverty, let us touch this. First of all, we say that Allah Azza wa Jal has given man free will, the power of free will. We are understanding why Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't intervene. Now, I'm going to make this into a one, two, three, four part answer. Sure. And we will go step by step. And sure. we will also use the Quran because we are talking with faith based people Indeed. who want to consolidate their belief, who want to come into terms with these two apparently contradicting beliefs. Yes. The first verse that we refer to within the Quran, Surah Al. Kahf. By the way, this uh, discussion is not uh, explicitly tackled over here within the text, but uh, this is a research that we have put forward in order to add value uh, to the mushahideen, to the viewers, such mm -hmm. that when you are studying classical texts, you can see how to take the teachings from a classical text and apply them to contemporary issues. Excellent. You find that Surah Al-Kahf, huh? and even more important than that, using the Quran, using the Quran to establish Usuluddin and Aqidah. Mm -hmm. And this is actually one of the most important goals, where you find even within the Muslim world, even within the Shia world, unfortunately, people will go minna and minna here and there to go and find teachings of Usuluddin and Aqaid when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the basis and the charter of Usuluddin and Aqaid within the Quran and within the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt. فَتَشْوِيكًا To train ourselves and to encourage ourselves to take Aqeedah and Usuluddin from the Qur'an. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says within the Qur'an, Surah Al-Kahf, verse number 29. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَقُلِ الْحَقِّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Holy Prophet, وَقُلِ الْحَقِّ and say, this is truth from your Lord. Yani religion, be it existence of Allah or be it from within the usul or the furu'ah. Allah says, this is truth from your Lord. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ The one who wants can believe. And number two, the one who doesn't want can disbelieve. The one who wants believes, and the one who wants disbelieves. What does this verse of the Quran 
entail? What does this indicate? This number one, it indicates two things. It indicates a number of things. We have not even completed the verse, but we'll touch on two things real quick. Number one, again, bain al kausain between brackets. Number one, this is a reinforcement of the verse of the Quran, la ikraha fi deen. There is absolutely no compulsion in the religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not compelled, none of us have the right to compel anyone into the religion. The truth is placed in front of you. To believe or not to believe, ya akhi, you have no right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving or commanding the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam to present the truth from your Lord. Amma for the natija, the consequence, the one who wants to believe will believe. The one who doesn't want to believe, so let him not believe. There is no compulsion. From this part of the verse, we are able to understand that forced conversion. Or number two, killing people who do not subscribe to the same faith as yourselves is against the Quran in its entirety. Mm -hmm. And we have seen over and over again from within the media, terrorist organizations, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, ISIS, and MashaAllah, their colors and their names are of different types and different shades. How many times have we seen on the media Shia being executed at gunpoint Indeed. in Pakistan, in Iraq, in corners of the world in Nigeria by Muslims killing other Muslims, gunpoint execution. I remember there was <coughs> a time back uh, and uh, this is when uh, ISIS, the Bani Umayyah of our time, La'anatullah, Alayhim, uh, when they had caused havoc between the borders of uh, Syria and uh, Iraq, there was at one point where they had arrested the lorry driver. And they said to him, what is the proof that you are a Muslim? He came out of the truck and obviously he was terrified. So they came and they grabbed him and they said, uh, if you are not Muslim, we are going to kill you. And he came out swearing and uh, swearing and he taking an oath by Allah. I'm a Muslim, I'm a Muslim and my name is Kada Kada, Muslim name and this and that. And they didn't believe him. So they said to him, well, if you are a Muslim, prove to us you are a Muslim. How do you pray? And this man was terrified. <coughs> they asked him how many raka in Fajr and how many in Maghrib. And it seems that he wasn't a practicing Baba, whether he was practicing or not. The End result over here is that because he couldn't answer the questions in regards to their faith, and yani their faith, yani the mukhalifin, not according mm -hmm. to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, they executed the man on the spot. And then from there they would raise this slogan, Dawla Islamiyah, the Islamic State. And the Islamic. What Islamic State? They said we are coming to uphold the Quran, we are coming to uphold the Sunnah of Rasulullah. Ya Sunnah of Rasulullah. Surah Al-Kahf verse 29 in itself gives very clear statement over here. Your job is to present the truth. If the people believe, they believe. If they don't believe, they don't believe. Where did this issue of killing on the basis of faith and killing in the name of Islam come into the picture? And that even thousands if not millions of Muslims pledging their support for institutions and organizations like this. There was a stream of volunteers who went and fought on the ground. People who migrated even from the UK under the fold of the Islamic Khilafah and this and that. <coughs> so this is the first. Coming back to something which is more pertinent within uh, returning back to our answers over here. We said, the question again, just in case we are distracted by the side arguments. Why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervene? If he is yes. so powerful in order to eradicate poverty, we said four step answer. Step by step, we want to create a thought process and come towards a conclusion using the Quran and the Hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as per Surah Al Kahf, beginning of verse 29. Whoever wants will believe, though whoever wants can disbelieve. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every human being the faculty of free choice. 
and free will. He has given man the faculty of free will and choice to act and behave as they want. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not impose upon us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not interfere in our daily course of actions and decisions. He has presented for us truth and then given us the free will and the choice to either act upon the truth or not act upon the truth. So, the first thing to understand is that when we are trying to understand our Lord and the actions of our Lord and when the Lord intervenes and doesn't intervene, the first thing that we need to understand is God has given us free will. He has given us the faculty of intellect and to make choices without any sort of duress from Him. This is step one. Step number two. Take from Surah Al-Mulk. Look at what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Tabarak al-Ladhi biyadhi al-Mulk, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Yani, blessed is that Lord. This is a very rough translation. Blessed is that Lord. Alladhi biyadihi al-mulk who has total authority. Mulk yani, he has total authority. Wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. And he has absolute power over everything. So look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes this concept of qudra. And then he goes on to say, Alladhi khalaka al-mawta wal-hayata. The one who created death and life. Why? لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala. Created death and created life. Created death, what does it mean? We will leave for now. Created life. Why? Such that he may test you. Which one of you, O mankind, is virtuous? So now, before we go to break, we've established two things. God has given us free will. Number two, he has created yes, us to test us. The rest of the answers, after the break. Inshallah, I send Shaykh Khan, inshallah, join us after the break, where Shaykh Manju, inshallah, will continue with the rest of the points of the answer. Inshallah, after the break, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the live Facebook. Sheikh, now before we broke up, we were discussing an uh, important question in regards to the Qudr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and why there's no intervention. Uh, before the break, you mentioned two points. You mentioned how you know, the religion is, is the truth and it is those who want to believe can believe and those who don't, don't, as in we have a choice. And secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created life to test us. Ahsanto. So when we are understanding why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not intervene this in order to, for example, eliminate poverty despite him being all-powerful? To get to the answer, we have a four-part process. The first part of the answer, we said that Allah Azza wa Jal has created man with the faculty of free choice. Allah does not impose his will uh, under human being when it comes to making decisions of truth, lifestyle choices. One. Number two, we said that 
we are now building the to the answer with these four points. Number two, we said from Suratul Mulk, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says that He has created Alladhi khalaq al mauta wal hayata liyabluwakum. He has created death and life. Created yes. life. Why? In order to test yes. mankind. Mankind is in a realm of an examination. Ayyukum ahsanu amala. Which one of you is most virtuous in their deeds? So now we see we have two parts to an answer. We have free, the element of free will and choice. Number two, the element of an examination and the test. If there is an element of an examination and a test, that means there has to be a realm of results. A realm that will take you to accountability in regards to how you performed in this test in the dunya. Which brings us to our next point, which is the point of Ma'ad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Quran says, Suratul Zalzala, Suratul Zilzal, which is famously known. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa man ya'mal mithqala dharratin khayran yara. Wa man ya'mal mithqala dharratin sharran yara. The one who performs an atom worth of a good deed shall be rewarded for it. And the one who performs an atom worth of a bad deed, of an evil deed, shall get the punishment for that. Therefore, we understand that if we understand man is free, and the man is in an examination and that there is in front of him a realm of existence which is known as the realm of accountability, the fifth part of Usuluddin Ma'ad, yes. then we understand that Allah Azza wa Jal will not intervene in the daily action of man because if he intervenes in the daily action of man then the realm of existence that lies ahead of us in regards to accountability becomes null and void. So therefore you find that the way we act in the world if I am the reason for poverty creating poverty if I, through my actions, through my misconduct, through my greed and through my lust, am creating poverty in the world, know that I am going to be accountable to a supreme deity. Now, if this supreme deity was to intervene, then where is the logic in accountability? Where is the logic in regards to free will? Because God has given you that free will and we are exercising that free will to do evil or to do good based on where we use our free will and how we use our free will and our faculty of choice, we will be judged accordingly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similarly, the one who is madloom, the one who is oppressed and the one who is a victim Know that for this victim, there is a realm of justice and that realm of justice in itself is divine and eternal. This is one. Leading up to this, Ya Habibi, it is well understood that the poverty and the anarchy that we see in the world today is as a result of the action of man. It's not the action of God. Yes, so to blame the finger on God for the action of man is another logical fallacy. And mm. you see, we remind ourselves of this on a daily basis, particularly when we are reciting Dua Al-Ahad and we are yes. pledging allegiance to Mawlana Sahib Al-Amri Wal Zaman, where we say to him, ظهر الفساد 
في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس. The verse or this part of the du'a is a reflection of the verse of the Holy Quran. That corruption has spread on this earth. On the plains, on the earth, and in the seas, and in the waters. This entire world is filled with corruption due to the action of man. Man is responsible for the poverty and the chaos and the anarchy on earth. Tayyip. Having said this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided us with a system through which we would be able to live in a world which is free of poverty and free of anarchy. But man himself decided to wage war against the system of God. Man himself decided to not submit to the laws of creation and the laws of perfection and the system of perfection as a result of which humanity is entrenched in chaos. And those who believe, maybe a person comes forward and says, well, not everybody who believes in, uh, not everybody who is against God. There are believers who are suffering. In fact, the believers are the greatest victims. Correct, mm -hmm. they are the greatest victims. However, they have an understanding of the Akhirah. So long as there isn't a collective understanding in regards to collective universal understanding in regards to deen, chaos and anarchy will prevail on earth. Which is why when we refer to Imam al hujja ajalla ta'ala farajahu sharif the Holy Prophet describes him by saying, الَّذِي يَمْلَأُ الْأَرْضَ عَدْلًا وَكِسْتًا كَمَا مُلِئَتْ ظُلْمًا وَجَوْرًا And this is why we call the universe, we call mankind towards Islam, the Islam of Ahlul Bayt, because the solution towards the eradication of poverty, the solutions towards the Eradication of anarchy and chaos is the Islam of Ahlul Bayt. And the people who came forward with this message on behalf of Allah suffered or experienced nothing but suffering, but persecution and assassination. And the one who came forward, Yani, let me put it for you in very cut clear, black and white. Ya akhi, the anarchy that we see today is because of the fact that the rights of Amirul Mu'mineen were usurped. Amirul Mu'mineen salam's teachings, even by their own Shia, are not implemented. If the world was to implement the teachings of Amirul Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, this world would not even smell poverty. This world would not even witness anarchy. And, you know, look at two examples, such that this is not just seen as an empty slogan. We have to say everything with Dalil. The government of Amir al-Mu'mineen, by the way, is the greatest example. Within the four years that... <coughs> excuse me. Within the four years that Amir al-Mu'mineen ruled, you find that despite the civil wars that were imposed upon him, Amirul Mu'mineen and the Rasulullah's government, government in Medina. These are the only two governments in human history that saw no poverty once Islam in itself was established. Look at these two rules, these rules of Allah Azza wa Jal through Ahlul Bayt. If they were to be implemented overnight, Habibi Sayyid Mohsin, without an exaggeration, 80% of the world's problems in regards to poverty would be eradicated. Two rules. Number one, the rule in Islam that states, by on authority of the Holy Prophet and Amir al Mu'minin, to paraphrase, there is no land tax in Islam. Mm -hmm. Ajib. There is no land tax in Islam. Islam states that ownership of land is a fundamental human right. 
How is water a human right and a necessity? How is food a human right and necessity? Baba, we live at a time where people are even now debating and are putting forward that the internet is a human necessity. If you don't have internet, you are madloom. Ahna, 1400 years ago, the Holy Prophet in Islam, the law of Allah on earth, has stipulated that to be a landowner is your fundamental human birthright. The government, the system, no establishment, no government has the right to restrict any human being, any citizen of the state from owning land. The job of, yes, the job of the government is to manage the distribution of land amongst the citizens of the state and ensure there is no anarchy on that side. But ownership of land, the minute you are born, according to Islam, you have a right to own land, free of charge. The la government cannot tax you, land tax, cannot sell land to you. You do not have to be homeless. Aslan, the concept of homelessness does not even exist yes, yes. within the Islamic teachings. Leave homelessness. If you follow into Islamic economics and the economics of Ahlul Bayt, the concept of renting a home is something that is ajib and gharib. Mm -hmm. Renting, ijar, ijarul bayt. Just now, <laughs> maybe you could say 50, 60, 70% of the real estate industry is built upon rental homes. Indeed, especially in, in London. Especially yeah. in London. In Islam, this is something very strange. For very strange, very minimalistic. Why? Because the fundamental right of every human being is to be able to own land and to have the ability to build that land. Today, majority of the people are even struggling to be first-time homeowners. Farmers have lands or don't have access to lands to cultivate or for agriculture. Yes. People have skills, they don't have land to own home. They can't afford it. The government charges them. Islam says, out with that. Rasulullah said this. Amirul Mu'mineen implemented this. In, uh, imagine a world. Imagine a world where there is no restriction on land ownership. No taxes on land ownership. Aslan, no fees to be paid on land ownership. Your piece of land, according to your needs, granted to you free of charge. How much in itself is that a push towards eradicating poverty? So how can you come and you tell me that, oh, if your Lord is all-powerful, why doesn't he intervene to eradicate poverty? Ya Baba, my Lord has given me the solutions in the form of a religion to eradicate poverty. He will not enforce those solutions to me, but he will judge me based on whether I implemented them or not in the Akhirah, in the realm, which is why we brought in the issue of Ma'ad. This is one example. Of how or one part, one economic policy. Ya Allah. Today, Change a lot. <laughs> the United Nations and we are celebrating. This is the 10th of December. Uh, is the day where, uh, you know, it marks the 70th anniversary of the uh, Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights Charter. 70 mm -hmm. years. And a number of countries have signed up to this. We have kalam in regards to the history of human rights, in regards to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Uh, but you can imagine if nations worldwide were to sign this charter, no land ownership. Teachings of Ahlul Bayt, and begin with the Muslim countries first. How long, how far would this go in regards to eradicating poverty overnight? Mm -hmm. This is one. Number two. My Lord has given me solutions. Our Lord has given us solutions to eradicating poverty from or through the teachings of Ahlul Bayt from the taxation system in itself. In Islamic economics... No human being can be taxed on their 
income ever. No human being can ever be taxed on his income. Impossible. This is a crime in the world, in the, in the <laughs> economics of Islam. <laughs> it's a crime. It's an offense. It's a theft. Oh, Her Majesty is a criminal according to Yeah, him. subhanallah. <laughs> Where is the taxation in Islam? In zakat and khums. Khums. Khums is a tax on your savings. Indeed. Imagine living in a world where your taxation is not a percentage of your income before your expenses. Mm -hmm. This is why you have gross income and net income. income. Your gross income and then deduct your taxes and your contributions and your ma'ad issue. And by the time you know you have a minimalistic net income. Law yeah. in Islam, the taxation is not in your income. The taxation is on your savings. Baba, 20% of your net savings. Mm -hmm. Imagine in the world today, if the world was to get together through the UN or without the UN or whatever, a collective human movement, 6 million human beings who are all staunch believers from the 6 million remove, 1 billion, 5 billion people from 5 remove. Human movement across the globe, 4 billion people who want the teachings of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib to be implemented and will take collective social measures, non-violent obviously, to ensure that this is fulfilled. What do you think will happen in the world overnight just with the shift in the taxation system? I think a lot of, a lot of people will start paying their taxes. <laughs> taxes on savings, ya akhi. No. Baba, once you have paid all your bills and you have fed your family and you have clothed them, not only that, not your necessary expenses. Once you have gone on holiday <laughs> and you have had your ice creams and Delicious. luxuries and everything, what remains from that? 20% is the tax that is owed to the government. A change in the taxation system, a change in the system of land ownership. Two rules within Islam. That Islam of Allah Azza wa Jal as is stipulated within the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. Two rules, two policies if they were to be globally implemented overnight. 70% minimum. Conservatively, 70% of world poverty would be eradicated with a blink of an eye. Therefore, Ya Ikhwani, when we come to understanding this argument, why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervene and eradicate all this poverty that we see in front of us? We have a fully fledged answer. Number one, God has given us free will and choice. And based on how we use this free will and choice, we will be judged in the hereafter. And number three, who said Allah has, doesn't intervene? Allah has given us a system of prosperity. But it is us collectively as human beings who are either ignorant of this or who want to fight against this. And hence we say, tabligh and tabligh and tabligh. The key to economic disparity, the key to social problems, the key to every anarchy that we see on the earth today is the lack of a correct theological understanding. Mm -hmm. A lack of a correct aqidah and usuluddin. In one of these um, talks, uh, Remember that uh, when it came to understanding universal human rights, uh, there was a discussion going that universal the human rights, this concept of human rights, is very 
subjective in that one person's understanding of human rights is different from another person's understanding of human rights. One person's understanding of human rights is different from another person's understanding of human rights. And what happens is that with this, we can never have any standard definition. And one of the researchers was of the opinion that to have a homogeneous standard understanding of human rights across the globe is, is a very utopic sentiment. It's a utopia. It cannot really exist. I said, Ya Subhanallah, if these people were exposed to Islam and they had faith in this awaited Mahdi, what they perceive to be a utopia is actually not utopia, is a reality okay. that is in the fold of happening. The, the basis of one uh, standardized definition of human rights already exists, and that is Islam within the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, the, the letters of Amir al Mu'mineen, and the whole uh, Risalat al Hukuk of Imam Sajjad. No free soul would be able to, to dispute on the common sense and the lofty values within those treaties of rights. <coughs> For Ehna, we say that when it comes to understanding why does God not intervene, we have to understand the purpose of our creation and the overall picture in order to understand, if you can use these words in layman's terms, how Allah functions. Yeah. If a person understands these answers, I believe they are able to consolidate between these two uh, realities. The one that Allah Azza wa Jal is Qadir and why Allah does not intervene, having seen all the poverty that there is in front of us. Shaykh I'm going to put you on the spot here. Um, plain devil's advocate, if you're saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't intervene, then what's with all the praying, what's with all the du'a and the shafa'a? There must be some sort of significance and some sort of intervention of as well. Of course. When we don't say that when we, or we don't want to uh, portray a misconception that Allah Azza wa Jal does not intervene in anything. La. Allah Azza wa Jal, He has control over everything within the universe and the Lord of the Creator intervenes in a number of things, in a number of, uh, uh, you could say, in a number of affairs or Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala administers a number of affairs through the awaited Imam as well. The Imam who is in Ghaibah is not an Imam who is retired or an mm -hmm. imam who is not in function. Yes. That is not. What we are saying is that this large global human change that we are trying to achieve and expecting for the Lord of the universe to use his divine power to come and change the scales, this, is, this understanding is wrong. And on the other hand, it is also wrong for one to assume or for one to think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no role inside. This leads us towards the argument of the Jabriya, the ones who believe the Madrasatul Jabr and the Madrasatul taf uh, ta Tafweed, the ones who believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not uh, involved in the administration or in the control of anything. He created the Khalq and he left them with what they are. Mm -hmm. No, well, we see both of these arguments are incorrect as we will see in the Bahath of Adala. In this day and age, dua is important. In every day and age, dua is important and the ma'asum imam carries out the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and intervenes in a number of crucial daily events 
but perhaps in a manner that you and I are not able to recognize. And what comes into mind is the tawqi' of the 12th Imam, Ajalala Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif to Sheikh Mufid, where he says to Sheikh Mufid, had it not been for us, the Imam says, had it not been for us, your enemies would have devoured you. Look at all the trials and the tribulations that the Shia are going through. Mm -hmm. And yet the Imam is saying, had it not been for us, yani, had it not been for the Imam and the Imam's intervention. And the intervention of the Imam is the intervention of Allah Azza wa Jal. Because the Imam acts on authority of and on behalf of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is the meaning of the word Khalifatullah. And therefore, you find that there are many issues where the Imam, had it not been for the existence of the Imam, had it not been for the intercession of the Imam, you find that we would perhaps cease to exist. Not even perhaps, we would definitely cease to exist had it not been for the intercession of the Imam. So a person should not lose hope in that sense and say, oh well, what is the uh, need of prayer and what is the need of dua and what is the use of dua if uh, I am entrenched in poverty over here and I will just wait for the akhirah. La. Each individual has to play his part. Our first part of the discussion, the answer is on a holistic collective level. On an individual level, even a person who is on the other hand of the poverty, who is the side of the victim, and even particularly if he's within the faith, because he will come and say, Baba, I believe in Amir al-Mu'mineen. I'm trying to implement the teachings of Amir al-Mu'mineen. If the establishments around me don't want to do that and have overpowered me, then what is my fault? That is a valid argument as well. And over here we say, this is where the concept of dua comes in, the concept of wasila comes in, the concept of shafa'a comes in, talab al-hajat, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us outlets through Ahlul Bayt where if we were to use them, we are able to lift ourselves and change our own destiny Asana. by having drawn this connection and this power with a divine deity, Allah Azza wa Jal. So everything has to be understood in the correct scale and in the correct measure. Shaykh, welcome to the end of the show. Any final points you'd like to give to the viewers on this discussion? Maybe something in regards to debating with those who actually pose such questions as we do. Shantou, it's important to always research and to always uh, try and draw answers to questions like these. And a person should not be intimidated by questions like these. If he's not able to answer, you know, uh, scholars, mashallah, are in abundance uh, and uh, is always important rather than hiding these questions or sweeping these questions under the carpet or saying no they don't affect me or I don't want to think about it, it's, it's too complicated, no. person should be bold, he should try and counter these questions, he should try and get answers towards them because this only strengthens the faith. If these questions are unanswered, they are like doubts that are planted in the seed, uh, that are planted like seeds in the mind and they will grow up to be trees of waswasa, which the shaitan will then use to deviate man years later on. Person should not be scared of asking such questions, should not be scared of being involved in debates of such nature. And number three, the most important thing, always use the Quran and the Hadith as the primary sources of Usuluddin. Much as we use textbooks, one of the beautiful things we said about this text in the beginning of the series was that it makes constant references to the verses of the Quran mm -hmm. and to Hadith of Ahlul Bayt. Thank you very much, Sheikh, for tonight's discussion. And thank you to all the viewers for joining us. Inshallah, we'll be back in the next episode with a brand new discussion, Inshallah, here on Imam Hussain TV3, the live Facebook. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Oh